Hacker, Atlas, Consul. Uh, wait, I'm missing at least two or three. A lot of things. So why don't you introduce yourself, Mitchell? All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, the first meetup, I'm going to start you off a real beginner topic. Uh, no, but actually, if you're a beginner and go, this could be a little bit rough, uh, but uh, it's more of a conceptual talk, so it should be okay anyway. Um, I'm going to talk about today uh, Go plugins using RPC. Um, it's the plugin system we use at HashiCorp, but I'll go into uh, what it's used for, why, and so on uh, in a little bit. So I got an introduction, uh, but the only interesting thing here is uh, the Twitter handle, if you want to ask me any questions and you don't get a chance to while you're here. Uh, so I helped uh, start a company called HashiCorp. Um, we make a bunch of things, which Matt almost got all of them. Uh, uh, so these are all the things we make. Uh, Vagrant, not in any order here. You can figure it out based on the letter, though. Uh, Vagrant, Packer, Surf, Console, Terraform, Vault, Nomad, Auto, and Alice. Um, so you might have used one or more of these. Uh, but we work on all of these. There are all of them except Atlas are open source projects uh, with fairly large <laughs> communities, and uh, what they do ranges from purely like developer tools, like Vagrant's, like purely mostly developer tool used for some ops stuff, um, to more operator IT tools like Console or Packer, uh, to very uh, security oriented tools, which is which is Vault. So a lot of different categories here. Um, of these tools, four of them have plugins, uh, and soon to be five, I guess. But four of them have plugins, and we had a need for plugins uh, from very early on. So uh, these are the four that have plugins, and here are the dates that they came out, so or the years they came out. So starting from 2013, when we built Packer, uh, we had a need for plugins, and that was also the first project they ever worked on in Go. Uh, it was probably Go 1.1 at that point, um, but uh, Go. You know, didn't support a plugin system. Uh, sort of still doesn't. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go talk more about that in a second. But the goals, um, the reason why we wanted a plugin system is really coming from something like Vagrant, which is the first thing I made. The, one of the things that makes it really great is the ability to plug almost anything. Uh, there's a, a huge plugin ecosystem. Uh, any missing feature that uh, I might even be planning on implementing, the community can implement in the meantime, and I could, you know, they could contribute it back or so on. And the, the tools we're creating, so Packer creates uh, machine images for any sort of anything that can have images, uh, including like containers. Um, uh, Terraform is able to control any cloud resource or in any cloud. Uh, Vault has various backends for supporting secrets and things like that. And all these things you want the community to be able to extend, because otherwise you have to support it all in master in your own code base. And there's some features that you just disagree with or don't have time to maintain or so on, and you really just want the ability to defer stuff to plugins. So wanted a plugin system. Uh, what I was looking for in the plugin system was uh, useful extensibility. So basically, I wanted, to, I didn't want a complete extensibility. I just wanted you to be able to add things that were relatively useful to the project. Uh, so Packer, for example, you could add new things to build uh, new images for, but you can't add new CLI commands. For example, like I just wanted something useful to extend. Uh, beginner friendly. I didn't want plugins too difficult to write. Uh, didn't want you to have to be a professional Go uh, programmer to do it, especially when I was doing Packer. Very few people use Go, so that was uh, a risk that I was taking. Easy to install, manage, fairly straightforward, and and stable. What I mean by stable is is maintain stability for the host process. So I don't want plugins to be able to crash the thing that's running the plugin. I wanted relative safety there. Uh, so that'll be important a little bit later too. So traditional plugin systems sort of look like this, where this whole black, this whole box around it is a process. Um, and these are either source or binary blobs of code. Um, so if it's like Ruby, these could all just be Ruby source files. But if it's C, these could all be actually compiled uh, things. Uh, so traditional plugin systems uh, and most things work by somehow loading external things with into the same process. Uh, for Ruby, that's just loading the file, or, or dynamic languages, it's mostly just loading the file. For things like C, it's, it's uh, shared libraries and dynamic linking. Um, and so this is what it looked like. So of the four things I'm looking for, a traditional plugin system uh, can provide you useful extensibility. You could do almost anything with that, so it's, that's <coughs> fair. Uh, being more friendly to author, it's really up to how you design the libraries around it, but I, I would say it could do that. Uh, 
easy to install, usually pretty easy because you drop it somewhere and the host process just loads it up. Um, but the one this one failed pretty hard at is stability. Uh, when you load something into the, the host process, you get access to the memory uh, somehow, even in a memory safe language like Go, and you know, a one null pointer dereference and usually the whole process could crash out. So that was kind of iffy for me, but, but it was still an option. Uh, so that sort of failed it, but the, the actual thing that made this not possible, this is what uh, Vagrant does, but the actual thing that made this not possible more than anything uh, is that Go doesn't support dynamic loading. So it was sort of off the table anyway from the beginning. So Go is currently working on some of this stuff. There's a, I don't know what version it's slated for. Uh, parts of it started appearing already in released Go versions, but the actual plugin standard library hasn't yet. Uh, but I'm going to talk more about what Go is doing later and sort of my view on that. So then the alternative, which I saw as a potential possibility, um, was a multi-process plugin system. Um, that looks more like this, which is you know, the same thing. The boxes are processes. These are some, some sort of executable. And then they all remain in their own processes. Uh, and there's somehow communication happening between them. Um, this is very like, this is what I hoped would work and wasn't sure at the time if I could actually make work and go. So um, of these things, I'll just fast forward through it. It could do all four. Um, the main difference with stability is that if the plugin process crashes, uh, it crashes pretty hard, and it's up to the host process to realize that the connection broke and handle that in a graceful way. But you could usually maintain stability in some way, even if that means that the host process has to has to quit. At least it's not a crash. It could be like the plugin system. This plugin failed uh, with this panic or this crash, uh, and give it at least give you a nice error out on the other side. So um, this was sort of. This looked good, and this seemed possible with Go. So moving on to the core idea of how this would work in Go. This was in 2013, so uh, and actually about three years, because Packer was started in, in January that year. So um, over the three years, the core idea hasn't changed. Um, the plugin system has seen a lot of evolution, which is what we're going to go through. But the core system itself has proved pretty stable uh, and work. So when I was first getting started with Go, uh, my goal was to make plugins as easy as just implementing an interface. Uh, I wanted plugin authors to feel like it was very idiomatic Go, they're just implementing an interface, um, and plugin users, the host process, to feel like they're just using an interface and, and sort of not realizing that this multi-process stuff's happening. It's just, it feels like you're calling an interface you wrote in another Go file that you just loaded. Uh, but really there's a lot more machinery going on. That was the goal. So. Uh, if you imagine an interface that looked like this, like you have a greeter interface that has a greeting returns a string, um, I wanted writing a plugin to be effectively this easy. Like I did it, how this gets loaded, not my problem as the plugin author, uh, but now I'm done. Uh, and maybe that a little bit of extra, I just want it to be this easy. Like just here's the thing I want to be a plugin, you do all the rest of the plumbing. Uh, so the goal was, yeah, the host process uses interfaces like usual, the implementer just writes Go as usual, and there's no weird building. You know, with, with C, with shared libraries, there's a lot of weird GCC flags you have to pass and things like that. Um, with Go, I just wanted it to just be Go build, no special flags, like just make it work. Um, and that was sort of the game plan that I was going with. So this is more concretely what it ended up looking like uh, as I moved on to this like point one or V1 version of this is, you had a bunch of things written in Go, and I would use NetRPC, which is a standard library for uh, RPC and Go, to actually communicate between them. And uh, in theory, NetRPC lets you actually use any language on the other side. Uh, but for this initial version, I was using Gob, and it's unlikely you would implement Gob in any other language. So it was effectively limited to Go, but I was trying at the time to limit scope to actually make this thing work. Because uh, at this point in time, I still wasn't sure if it was actually possible. So I was just experimenting uh, around. So now let's start diving into the details um, of how this thing works, uh, what it supports, and, and so on. And this has actually changed a lot over the years. So the basic idea hasn't changed, but a lot of the internals uh, have changed. So plugin system evolution. So this started with supporting Packer, uh, but over time, over the three years, um, we've extended the plugin system to be used in four, soon to be five products. Um, has been used on by millions of users, sort of, and tons of different machines, uh, Windows, uh, Mac, Linux, and we've learned a lot, it's matured a lot, and so necessarily I didn't get it right the first time, so things have changed uh, to where they are today. 
And when I was looking back uh, over different products to try to structure the evolution of this talk, I've found basically six major evolutions, or five, not getting the initial one, major evolutions of the plugin system. So uh, now that you know sort of the core idea, I'm just going to go over how it evolved to become uh, what I consider a very stable, production-ready um, you know, system that works on both desktops and server machines, and, and fairly high performance. <coughs> so the original. Um, this is the, the core idea that I was talking about. This is how the original system worked in, let's say, February 2013. Um, this is how the original thing worked that proved to me that it was possible and uh, that, that this could be shippable. So if you, the two, the, the terminology I use is there's the host, and the host is always the thing that is consuming the plugin, and then there's just the plugin, because uh, client's kind of a weird word, because they could both, yeah, it's, it's arguable. So host and plugin is what I'll use. Um, so here's basically the, the, the timeline of what happens when a plugin is loaded and used. So you obviously start with the host process. The host process itself is responsible for executing the plugin, which is its own process. So it's, it's launching that. Uh, the plugin then talks back to the host uh, about how to connect to it, and we're going to go in detail over each of these. Um, we'll talk back to the host of how to connect to it. The host then makes the NetRPC connection back to the, the, the uh, plugin and does you know, back and forth request response. And then we'll get into why data streams have to exist. But um, pretty, the top three are pretty straightforward. You, you launch the thing, you connect to it, normal NetRPC. That was a core idea. That's relatively unchanged, but that's, that was, that's how it works. In more detail, um, launching the plugin. So the, one of the things it does with launching the plugin is it first does this thing, which was an idea I had from Erlang, um, which sets a magic cookie. The name is also from Erlang, like a magic cookie environmental variable. It's basically an environmental variable with a hard-coded UUID. And if the plugin process doesn't see that environmental variable, it assumes it's probably because someone that shouldn't be launching it launched it and just gives a very nice, friendly user, friendly error message, which is like, this is a plugin. You're not supposed to launch me directly. You probably meant to run this command, which is the host, which will launch me on its own. So this is just a, a, a user-friendly <laughs> thing so that if you launch the plugin, you didn't get all this weird NetRPC garbage coming out of standard app. So that, not a security thing, just a user experience thing. Um, the next thing is an environmental variable to set port ranges. Um, so this tells the plugin what port ranges it could use to actually make connections. Uh, this is sort of unnecessary now, but still exists today. Um, next, it starts a subprocess, straightforward, and then it waits for the TCP address. So uh, we'll explain what that means in the next one. Uh, throughout this, I'm just going to show code samples. Um, walking you through the entire plugin system would be incredible, much more boring and, and really a lot more complicated for folks who don't know Go very well. So I just sort of screenshotted what things look like. So here's the magic cookie, and here's how like simple and kind of dumb it is, but it works pretty well. Uh, you just have the key, which is the environmental variable, the value, which is I think the way I generated it was I just SHA-256 summed whatever was on my desktop at the time. Um, got that, and then you check it as the first thing you do um, and put an error out. Uh, the errors are a lot better now, but that this is, uh, I, I went back, you can't see the URL, but I went back to actually the code I wrote in January 2013. So this is the original stuff. Um, that's pretty simple. And then there's the port range stuff. Um, so we would parse out the port ranges out of the environmental variables. Um, and actually do some stuff to set them up. Uh, still also simple. Then there's starting the sub-process, um, which was the third step. So this is now from the, the host side. Um, we just use OS exec, which is a standard library um, for executing it built into Go. Again, super simple. We just send the key value, the cookie values and other stuff and just off to the races. Nothing weird happening. Uh, and then there's a way for TCP address, which uh, I'm I'm going to ignore because we sort of talked about it right here. So uh, waiting for the TCP address. The problem was um, when you start a sub-process, there's only really two guaranteed methods of communication, and it's standard out and standard error. Those are the streams that are guaranteed to exist sort of with every process. You can't make any guarantees about file permissions. You can't use a file, um, things like that. So I decided <laughs> to use standard out and standard error as actually uh, a little protocol for communicating how to get started. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, how do I find the plugin once it's started? So the, what happens when you start the plugin, the first thing the plugin does is output a, start a listener and output a TCP address over standard out. Uh, and the host process reads standard out, the first line of standard out, assumes that's the address and then connects to it. 
Uh, and then the plugins were coded so that the, after the first connection comes in, it closed the listener, so the port's um, not in use anymore. Uh, that's pretty easy here. Like, nothing tricky. You just print it straight out to standard out. Um, sync the standard outs, because if it's buffered, it's a disaster. Um, and that's that. Then it makes an RPC connection. This is standard NetRPC, nothing, nothing weird at all. So you can see down here that we just do an RPC dial, which is the standard library function for connecting to the address we get. Um, and some of these screenshots, the code style might, might look weird for experienced Go people, but bear in mind when I wrote this, I've been writing Go for two months, so I also agree that some parts of it are pretty ugly, but uh, yeah, still super basic. So finally, the fourth thing, which was the confusing part of the diagram, the most confusing or nebulous of why is data streams. So when I hit this issue, when I first started the plugin system, I thought I was done. I thought, I was, I, I thought that there was no way to solve it so the plugin system couldn't work. Um, then I found a workaround. So standard NetRPC is command and response. You could, you could send multiple requests, and you could pipeline re responses uh, at a time, so you could request three things and it doesn't serialize them all. You could actually send responses out of order and things like that. That wasn't a problem. Um, but one problem was how do we simulate basically streaming data? You can't, you can't make a request and stream data back. It was, here's my request object, here's my response object coming back. And there is a lot of things that I need to actually stream data, um, simulate channels and things like that. So how do I do that? Um, so data streams uh, are kind of a hack around that. So basically anytime you need uh, a stream, what it does is it makes a request, and whereas normally in normal Go code it would just return like an IO reader, um, what the RPC returns instead is uh, another TCP address. Um, and then the, the shim between you calling the code um, and, and it talking to the plugin then connects to that TCP connection and wraps that in an, in an IO reader. So whereas before the IO reader implementation might be a, a, a fi open file, this time it's a TCP connection which goes to an open file or something, but Due to the beauty of sort of ghost interfaces, you never realize this stuff's happening. It's just all to the to the to the caller. It all feels like normal ghost still happening. So it was a it was sort of a hack on top of things that work completely worked. So these are side connections that are just pure TCP data streams um, or parallel net RPC connections. So I don't think I guess I do have the next one, but um, basically it's either IO reader, which is like pure data coming through, or you're returning another interface, which is uh, you know, another greeter. You're asking for a greeter and it's returning a greeter, so what it would do is actually create another RPC connection which simulates that interface. And so you'd have multiple layers of plugin communication happening with this plugin. Um, it's really neat from, uh, from the caller side because you don't realize any of this is going on, but it, you'll see later it proved to have some problems that we had to fix. Uh, but at the very least it got a 0 0.1 out the door. It worked. <laughs> um, so yeah, the interface is over plugin RPC. Um, the code ends up behaving just as I want it to. You don't realize that anything uh, is happening, but it does force you to make an implementation of an interface that accepts connections over an RPC channel, uh, RPC connection. So uh, the caller is calling, you know, an implementation of Greeter, uh, that example I showed earlier, but that implementation is actually just calling an RPC um, thing which is going over the network, which is going to an RPC server for that implementation, which is finally getting to the, the concrete implementation. So there's there's a lot of hops there, but uh, the end result is that you end up not really realizing any of this is happening. Um, and you do get the tricky thing, which is interface arguments or arguments that are structs with interfaces in them or interface return values. Um, and we're able to get around those with creating more and more RPC uh, connections. Uh, so, you know, one function call might end up making uh, a dozen RPC connections, but at least the caller was still really clean. Uh, so, I don't know what this is. Oh, so yeah, this is just showing that, like, as a user, so this was original Packer code, um, I'm pulling out this UI, which is an interface, so I'm pulling it out and then using it. And so it's just normal Go code, but what's actually happening under the covers is all sorts of, of RP, RPC uh, majiggery and multi-process stuff. So from a, from a user standpoint, it's totally normal. Uh, let's see, I don't know what this is showing. Oh, so this is showing for like the implementation of an interface that has uh, interface arguments, which was the tricky part. We actually create another RPC server, register those things, uh, and then return uh, an argument with that connection, basically. So. That is just sending a port uh, as an argument, not not any of this. So it's going to connect back to it. 
Yeah, no need. We went over this, so no need to do that. So you can sort of see this is the uh, this is for that function call what's happening. You call um, the provision method which I showed with two interface arguments. Um, instead of sending the arguments themselves, it's sending addresses. So the plugin itself is now connecting backwards um, to the arguments given with two and three. And then you have these side data streams that are being used for other RPC connections down there. And then at some point in the future, provision can actually return as well. But these could actually stay active for as long as you want. Uh, so other stuff, sort of finalizing the initial implementation, which uh, I'll admit is the, the, I guess, the deepest, like we, we had to go over the whole like foundation of the system, the rest becomes a lot more incremental. Uh, but we use standard out as a control channel, so uh, you can't use standard out at all in the plugin. We use it for communicating control data back and forth between the host and the, the process because it's the only reliable uh, connection you have. Network connections could still die. Um, standard error, we made a log channel. So anything the plugin sends on standard error, we mirror and log back with the, the plugin path prefix and the host so that you could actually debug plugins. So plugins can report data that shows up in a log. Uh, and then signals. Um, signals ended up being uh, taking a while to get right because they're pretty weird. But uh, in the initial version, we just made it so interrupts are completely ignored in every process. Uh, and the way it works is we'll, every, every plugin, when it receives the interrupt, it interrupt ignores it, sets a global flag, and it's up, to, uh, it's up to something in there to handle it in some way. Uh, optionally, or you could choose to just completely ignore it. Um, otherwise, the way signals worked was it gets sent to the whole process group. So anytime you you control C, it would it would kill everything basically in parallel or seemingly in parallel, and really weird stuff would happen. So uh, this made it so that we received the signal and it would be handled some point later uh, outside of a normal signal handling context. Uh, so success, like I, I, we shipped Packer, uh, it worked. I was super happy. I thought it'd be. I thought it worked pretty well. Um, ran a lot of testing, uh, but then you know, with the 0 0.1, you ended up getting bugs and things ended up changing. So, uh, so we had to create an iteration on this. So, the first iteration, which I'll just call V2 in this, was just addressing real-world problems. It was the first thing it ever shipped to the real world, and so we just had normal bugs you get from a lot more computers than your own running the code. So the good and the bad. The good is that the system worked for the vast majority of users. They had no idea that everything they were running was a plug-in, multi-process, any network connections were being made. It just felt like a CLI they were executing. So that was really cool. Um, the second thing is that plugins are easy. Almost from zero, from day one of 0 0.1, I started getting seeing plugins pop up in the community, which meant that it was easy to use. Like People were saying that I did the tour of Go at tour.golang.org, and then I wrote a plugin. So it was easy. So that was good. Uh, then some issues cropped up. So one is we're using network connections for everything, and even if they're local, uh, <coughs> fire, firewalls still don't want you opening ports. So we had some firewall issues that we had to deal with. Um, and then I suddenly had the issue of, I wanted to ship a 0 0.2 that made changes to the interfaces we're serving, uh, and that ended up causing panics all over the place. So how do we address uh, changing interfaces? So plugin system v2. Um, changes the changes just the green part, so you don't have to read everything all over again. It's all the same. Um, but the first thing I addressed was sending uh, the address and protocol. Address always came out, but it was only a port before. So now we send a full address, and the, the reason for that you'll see in a second. And then the other is a protocol version over standard out. So to address the firewall issues, um, so it turned out this was actually a Mac issue, which was the most popular uh, usage of Packer at the time. So uh, Mac with the firewall on doesn't even let you open a port bound to localhost. It just doesn't let you do it. Um, so the plugin system didn't work at all on that system. So I replaced uh, the TCP with the Unix domain socket in a temporary directory. Um, when possible in Windows, I still use TCP and it worked fine. Um, and then in the output, I would include the full address in the Go sense. So it would include. Uh, not just the port. So I would include the address like TCP comma and then the, the protocol and the address versus just the port. So in a Unix domain socket for, for the Go world, it would be Unix comma and then the path to the Unix domain socket. Um, and Go makes it really easy with net.dial, I think it is, net.dial, that you just get a protocol and an address and it figures out the rest. So that was pretty simple change, a pretty simple change to make to make the firewall issue disappear. And then the next one is protocol versioning. So 
In addition to outputting just the address, I now output it a protocol and then a, a, a pipe and then the address. Um, and if I didn't see a pipe, then it, I just assumed it was protocol zero, the first one I ever shipped. And basically, if the protocol version doesn't match the version of the host process, I just show an error, um, which is that the plugin is either newer or older, but either way, you, I can't understand it. Um, and the cool thing was, because the way Go works, uh, to fix this, it usually was just meant you recompiled the plugin. You would go get, it would download all the master stuff, which had the upgraded protocol information. You might get some build errors if the interface changed, but once you fixed all that and recompiled, it just worked, which was pretty cool. Um, I liked that a lot. So the protocol version is used for a couple things. Uh, it allowed us to change the wire protocol. So um, we never switched from NetRPC, but if we ever changed from NetRPC, um, we would just change the protocol version because it's bound to the standard out connection. It's way before any RPC happens, so we could do that. And then the one that, the, oh, and encoding, we actually did change from gob to message pack at some point. Um, I don't cover that, but at some point we did. That was just a protocol version change. Um, and the more important one, though, is changing interfaces. So anytime you add a method to an interface, uh, change parameters or anything like that, you, you up the protocol version, uh, and it's pretty simple. So once again, success, things are really good, shipped it, uh, worked really well, um, and now we can move on. So, so then I started making changes that, <laughs> that were different. So these were not real world issues. The real world issues were pretty much addressed. The system worked, I was happy with it, and now I was more into how do we make it better. It works, but how do we make it better? So V3 is all about optimizations. So the good is <laughs> now that the thing works, the thing is stable. Uh, the bad is that we get some weird issues once in a while that cause crashes, and um, this one is pretty straightforward. We get weirder ones later, um, but the issue is file handles. So we create a lot. I knew we, we created a lot of TCP connections because, uh, or connections in general, because anytime you know there's an interface argument or a data stream or any of that, we're creating new listeners, new connections. I knew that was the case, um, but I assumed it would be in the low dozens because they're getting closed whenever you're done with it. You know, Maybe I hit 100, um, but the way Packer worked is it's super highly parallel, and I got users early on that were doing you know, hundreds of builds in parallel with Packer, uh, and they were running out of file handles. Uh, it was actually hitting the file handle limit uh, in the tens of thousands, basically. And yeah, you could set the user's file handle. It wasn't hitting the kernel file handle limit, uh, but still it's, it's a clutch to be like, oh, to run, to run Packer, uh, with high parallelism, you have to change the U limit for your user. Like, it's a pretty weird clutch, so I wanted to fix this. Um, so what I ended up doing in the green is uh, still relatively the same, but now I wanted to multiplex the connections down onto a single connection. Uh, so what I did, which I don't recommend to anybody, and you shouldn't have to do ever again in Go because it's been done, um, not this one that's got scraps, as you'll see, but I wrote something called MuxCon, um, and that was about what, what I thought was only going to be a week, but ended up being like six months of my life, um, having this permanently in a browser in one of my screen, um, which is the TCP protocol. So I ended up implementing TCP on top of TCP um, in order to multiplex connections. So uh, it, it didn't exist at the time in Go. Uh, around the same time I did it, someone else did a better one, but I had already written this. Uh, and then you'll see later where we, we ended up replacing it anyway. But uh, Wrote MuxCon, it's just TCP-ish. Um, I'd say TCP-ish because uh, I thought I would be clever and ignore some parts of that diagram, but every box and every line of that diagram is critically important to make stable network connections work. So if you ever decide to implement TCP, uh, never think, for example, that you could uh, skip the fin weight one step. You can't skip that. So. <laughs> Um, so yeah, TCP-ish, so, but the idea was simple. I'll create a single connection between the host, the plugin, uh, and then I'll create multiplex streams on top of it that, that, were, that, that quacked like TCP, that were TCP. Um, and then it would eliminate all file handle issues because we'd have one connection per plugin process, which can definitely, uh, I'm not even being sarcastic, like that's not gonna get over like 100. You're not gonna have 100 plugins, uh, and we still have it to this day. So that was the idea behind it, and it worked. So I implemented it. I did it, uh, and it worked. And the cool thing again about Go is this implementation was super transparent even to the plugin system because it just implemented the netcon interfaces. So when you, at, with the previous connection, the previous methods that would create the side RPC things would now just open a stream that would just 
was a Netcon uh, interface and then uh, use it for the RPC client. So it was actually MuxCon itself, that file was like a thousand lines. Implementing TCP isn't, isn't short, but uh, all the code to integrate it was you know, a couple lines here, a couple lines there, and it ended up being uh, pretty nice. So I was happy with it, implemented it, uh, and it, and it worked pretty well. So then we move on to v4, sort of halfway through, and this is different. Um, actually with v3, v3 lasted a long time. Uh, it worked really well, and, and I didn't have any plans to improve it. Uh, but then we created our second tool that ever used the plugin system, which was Terraform. Um, so when Terraform came along, it just had different needs that uh, the plugin process didn't, didn't have because Packer didn't need them. But I didn't want to create a whole new custom plugin system for that, so I decided to build on top of what I already had to make it work. So actually the first part is, is a bug and then we'll get to the rest. So the system's stable and then I would though under weird <coughs> circumstances that I could never reproduce get very rare MuxCon crashes. So uh, like I said, I, it was TCP-ish, so I didn't implement TCP perfectly in a week. Um, who knew? So uh, basically once in a while I'd get very rare crashes and it was really unfortunate because the crashes were always like window size that packet 2 million was 64 and expected 48 and also the sequence number was wrong. And you're like, <laughs> I don't know how to reproduce that, so <laughs> I don't know. And, and so I'd open that diagram, stick it on there, and just stare at it and try to figure out what's wrong. But we saw this problem. And then Terraform came along. Uh, and Terraform added a few more requirements. So um, in addition to the very rare MuxCon crashes, well, we had, at the time we were using one plugin process per uh, interface implementation. So every plugin process can only serve a single concrete implementation of an interface. And the way Terraform works actually needs a lot of those. So we were finally reaching the point where, where even that would theoretically exhaust file handle limits. So we needed the ability to spin up one uh, plugin host that could serve multiple instances of that plugin. So uh, there's that. And then uh, installation of plugins. Uh, Terraform had a lot more plugins, so we needed the installation to be even easier. With Packer, you would have to configure a file, uh, and you'll see how we changed it with Terraform to be way easier. So in order, I think in order, the first thing we did was replace MuxCon with something called Yamix. Uh, and Yamix was also written by us, uh, but it was written by Armand, who's a lot smarter than me, and it was written uh, for a console, which is a server-side component, a high-performance component, and something that really, really can't crash. Like, Packer could crash, and it's not the end of the world. If console crashes, it's a really, really bad, a bad time for your data center. So um, Armand wrote this, same thing, looked at the same diagram, uh, uh, but implemented TCP into something we call the Amex. He actually was going to use MuxCon, and I was like, no, don't ever use MuxCon. It's not a good idea, but I didn't want to rewrite TCP again, so I just kind of let it go. But he, he wrote the Amex, and, uh, it's now used in, in a lot of our, actually all of our tools, I think, use Amex now. Uh, but at the time, it was just console, so I pulled this into, uh, into Packer at the time, and then Terraform as well. Um, so it's a real TCP multiplayer, multiplexer. It's not TCP-ish, it is, it is definitely TCP. Like I said, written for console, very stable, um, especially today. It, this is not years ago, but especially today, um, very few problems. So I replaced MuxCon with the Amex, got rid of all the crashes. I found one bug, but I found it right away, so that was that was good. And otherwise, it's been perfect then and since. So it's never had a problem since. And then the next thing, oh, not in order. So it was plugin installation. So then I added something called plugin auto discovery. So uh, I made it so that I would look in the directory with binaries, uh, your current working directory, and your home directory. And if the binary name matched a certain file like uh, glob, then I would try to load it. Because it's pretty easy to tell if it works. You know, you send, you launch it, you send the thing, and if it responds properly, you try to connect to it and see what happens. Um, but usually they're plugins. So example, like with Terraform, if you name a binary, Terraform provider AWS, the and put it in one of those directories, Terraform will just find it and load it as a plugin. So there's zero configuration necessary. Um, at some point, we switched the message pack too, so that could be something else. But um, no one's ever tried to do anything other than Go, um, so it's still theoretical there. But um, made the plugin installation really easily. And then the last thing was we, we implemented something called a dispenser. So um, the old model was you would have one interface implementation per process and basically when it started it and you connected to that, to that first address that came out, 
it was an RPC connection directly to that already created implementation of an interface. Uh, it looked like this. You could kind of tell. You could kind of tell by the, the the thing. You would serve something, and you just immediately instantiated it. So it was just that one thing that would ever be served from that process. Uh, the the new model was a little bit different. So the initial RPC connection that would happen is now a dispenser, um, and and the host would ask the dispenser to dispense certain plugin types or instances of plugins, and and every time it asked for a, a to, for it to dispense something, it would create a new instance of it, create a new, uh, you know, multiplex stream, connect to it, and you would have a new instance. So, uh, pretty simple, uh, required a protocol change, but uh, it was super important for Terraform. So now you could launch one AWS provider plugin host, for example, but if you connected to three different regions or you had different configurations for whatever reason, uh, it could instantiate it multiple times, which I show here. So this is before, and then this is after. Pretty obvious, and those were the changes that then shipped with Terraform. So, and those were backported to Packer. So Packer got all these things uh, and everything. Packer got rid of the Buxcon issues, used less file handles, uh, and got this sort of thing going on. Because in Packer, it was still possible to do, you know, two Amazon builds at the same time. But I used to just launch two, two hosts, uh, two, two plugin processes because it was you were never going to run enough. Uh, but now that that even reduced down to one, so that was pretty neat. And so then that, again, lasted for a pretty long time. Uh, the, since, since the plugin system is so stable at this point, it really wasn't getting many changes until we needed improvements. So the next thing that happened, which was late last year, um, was or summer last year, was, was Auto was coming out. So Auto had uh, different needs. Again, building on top of Terraform and Packer, we needed a plugin system. At that point, I had done it for two things, so it was a no-brainer to use it for the third. Uh, so the the... The good things that are happening at this point is that the auto discovery stuff was was more amazing than I thought it'd be. The, the community really loves it. Installing plugins is super super easy, uh, and we saw plugin growth a lot more in both Packer and Terraform because of it. It was a lot easier to install these things. Um, Terraform's usable. That's that's always a good thing, um, and the system is super super stable. We never <laughs> ever for for like 18, 12 to 18 months, never ever ever got a bug with the plugin system. Super stable, um, and these are things running on, on, on millions of downloads, basically. So the, the downside, though, is the things we needed in, uh, in auto. So uh, we needed TTY preservation. That's a weird, uh, uh, very boring sounding word, so I'll go into that in a second. Uh, standard out and standard error. So remember earlier I said you can't use those. You can't standard outs control standard errors logs. But auto actually needed standard out and standard error to tell people things, uh, because Auto's plugins would actually subprocess to other things, and we needed it to we would, it would effectively fork exec in a way, and we needed it to just become to work properly. So it needed that, um, and we're hitting a weird thing here where with we're dog footing our own plugin system. So even with Terraform, uh, Terraform at the time was shipping with uh, actually it still is shipping with like 30 different binaries. Uh, and Go binaries don't like share the core of Go, so every binary is copying all the runtime and everything it needs from Go. So a Terraform release, I think even if you go to Terraform today, uh, is in the hundreds of megabytes, and Packer was actually approaching the size of a Windows ISO. So it's pretty weird to download something that's, that's doing a lot less than an operating system, and it's 500 megabytes, and it's just because of this multi-process system. Uh, if, you, if you compile like Hello World with Go, it's still at least like a few megabytes. Um, and Packer does a lot more than that, so you end up with every binary being 12 to 20 megabytes. So you end up really quickly with very few plugins getting a huge archive. We didn't pay for bandwidth, so that wasn't the concern, but it still was a user experience problem. Um, so we wanted to fix that. So I'll go in order. Um, the first one is the TTY issue. So TTY preservation. Basically what that means is, is what Auto was doing was in a plugin, Auto was executing SSH. SSH, if you don't have a TTY, SSH is really weird. Um, you really want a TTY so that it behaves like you expect. Read line works, colors work. It does normal SSH things that uh, we all take for granted basically every day. So, but because we're using OS exec, the, the standard in was not a TTY anymore. And I'll, I'll show a diagram to explain why that was. So this is before. So before, the host would launch the plugin. Um, would connect standard in. So like standard in always went to the plugin, that wasn't a problem. Uh, but the way operating systems work, or, or all, the, all the major ones today, 
um, is when you create a new one that you, even if it's a pipe that's copying data, that's no longer a TTY even though the one coming into the host is. So um, by the time we executed SSH, it wasn't a TTY, so you'd get really awful SSH experience. You know, read line didn't work, so if you hit up, you would just get control characters. Um, there was no login shell, you wouldn't even get a prompt, but you would type like echo foo and foo would come out, so you know it was working, but things looked really weird. Uh, it took a while to figure out what was going on here, but uh, yeah, standard and needed to be a TTY. So after uh, what I did uh, was do this. So you can, basically the way it works is you need to make sure that when you launch the plugin, the actual file descriptor number that you're giving when you launch the plugin is identical. Like it is the same file descriptor and that's the only way to preserve a TTY um, that I could think, that I that was easy enough that I could think of. So what I do now is whenever I launch the plugins, we actually give it the file handle. Um, so now it's the same standard and file handle going to both. When when the plugin launches SSH, it does the exact same thing. It's like give it my file handle, which was the mirror from the host, uh, and then everything just magically worked. SSH worked great. And things work great. I've never tried to see what happens if multiple things try to use S standard in at the same time, but it doesn't matter for my use case, so this ended up working really well. And the next thing was standard out, standard error syncing. So, like I said, the early design was standard out control, standard error logs, uh, but now I needed it, and again, the use case here was SSH. Uh, SSH is just going to output the standard out, standard error. There's really very little you can do about that. So. I wanted a way to, to preserve it perfectly for, uh, for the output. And one of my thoughts was I'll just capture it and then stream it over a data stream and then have it have the host process copy it into standard out, standard error. But then I wondered if I could actually just make standard out and standard error work, because that would just be a lot simpler. Um, and so I was able to do that. And so the way I was able to do that is that original RPC connection. The first multiplex connection is always the dispenser. We went over that earlier. Um, so stream ID zero is always the dispenser. Then stream ID 1 is now always standard out, and 2 is standard error, um, and real standard out, standard error just works. And the way that works is pretty simple. I actually just changed the global OS standard out, standard error to point to those, uh, to point to those streams. So that, again, is, like, is, is a great thing about those interfaces. They all quack like the right interface, so when you write the standard out, standard error, the rest of the code just sort of works, but they're actually going over this multiplex TCP connection, which then on the, this is the plugin side, but on the host side is also just connected directly to the real standard out and standard error, so it all just ends up working. Uh, and then the last thing was plugin flattening. So flatten multiple plugin process into a single one. Uh, this is pretty simple. Instead of shipping with you know 70 binaries, we shipped with one, but subcommands launched the different plugins. So if you do uh, Terraform plugin provider AWS, that would invoke <laughs> just the AWS plugin. So we would ship a single binary uh, that we would re-invoke multiple times. So uh, the plugin command's internal, so even um, on the projects that have this shipped already, Terraform doesn't yet, but it's, it's done. Um, it's internal, so Terraform-H will never show you the command, but if you did execute it, it does, you, you will get the user error that like the magic cookie isn't set thing. So, that ended up reducing our, our file size of everything down to the size of a, of a normal Go binary um, with a lot of stuff in it, which for us is about like 20 megabytes. So we shipped that. That was late last year by the time we shipped it. Success. Things are looking good. That's, uh, as you can tell from me saying, like if, if for some shipped things and some not, that's still the current sort of state of the art of how things are. Uh, a lot of it's shipped and a lot of it's not, uh, but that's how things are today. But um, sort of, I'm already working on, on the next stuff uh, that we need. Um, so I'm just going to talk about what's sort of coming to even show like how the plugin system will be built on more. Uh, so the, the two things coming are cryptographically secure plugins uh, and user versioning. So cryptographically secure plugins um, are needed by Vault. So Vault is one of our newer projects, uh, the little domains down there. Uh, but what Vault does in, in three bullet points, just so you have an understanding, uh, there's a common saying in security, which is put all your eggs in one basket, then put that basket in Fort Knox. Um, Vault is meant to be that Fort Knox. So instead of trying to spread your security around uh, so you have to protect multiple things, it's better to actually put everything in one basket and protect the heck out of that one thing. Um, so that's what Vault is. It, it stores secrets. It dispenses uh, certificates. It's a complete CA. Um, it handles some parts of identity, ACLs, policy across everything. Um, and today it's used by, by huge companies and very highly sensitive uh, 
and vertical industries, basically. Um, the thing I like to say about Bolt is, uh, you know, if you've, <laughs> if you've used the U.S. financial system in any way, like a bank, traded stock, bought stock, used a credit card, went to an ATM, anything, you've probably gotten data that was encrypted at some point or stored in a Bolt. So that's, that's that. So it's used by a lot of companies, so it's pretty important to get this right. Um, so the initial design purposely didn't support plugins uh, to avoid increasing the attack surface area uh, for anything. I mean, to, to, to try to destabilize or exploit Vault in any way. Um, but we do want to support plugins because there's a lot of stuff that people want to do to Vault uh, that we don't want to put in Vault. So um, we are trying to figure out how to make this possible. And, and we've, we've designed it all and it's, it's ready to go um, in terms of uh, the, the design is done, just the implementation isn't done yet. Um, so, we again wanted to leverage our existing plugin system if possible. Um, so, cryptographically secure plugins, uh, basically the way it's going to work um, is one will digitally sign the binary. So, that's binary signing has been around a long time, works really well. Every major operating system uses it, your iPhone uses it, Mac App Store uses it, everybody uses digital app signing. Pretty simple. Um, so, we're going to do that. That's easy. Um, being, you know, the process saying, Launch this only if HashiCorp wrote it. That's an easy thing to do. The hard part is the harder part is this uh, time of check versus time of load vulnerability window. There is a very small window between saying are you made by HashiCorp, it saying yes, and you saying launch it, to an attacker swapping in an insecure one right between there. So you can't just do that. <laughs> so the difference we're going to do actually is we're going to read the entire plugin process uh, into memory, just the binary straight into memory verify the signature completely in memory, uh, and then write it to a secure location, which we know no one has access to with very, very, very restricted permissions, um, and then we're gonna execute it there. So that'll get around that. And we could go even further with the RPC connections and uh, use TLS between the RPC connections and encrypt all the data going through. Uh, but because we use Unix domain sockets and the way all our connections work, if you're reading that data, if you're man in the middling that data, even around this stuff, it means that you have root and have somehow gained access to the kernel. And uh, within Vault, it's, that is explicitly documented as not being part of our threat model. So if you have root or you exploited the kernel, then you're already outside of Vault's threat model to begin with. So we're not going to secure that. It would just lower uh, the, the performance of the plugins for something that it, it, you're, you're kind of in trouble anyway at that point for other reasons. Uh, so that's going to come pretty soon. And then there's user versioning. So user versioning is, is pretty simple as well. Uh, as, as the things with plugins are now reaching years old, uh, people want to be able to lock down and not change plugins. So they want to say, like, for Terraform, I depend on the 0.3 version of the AWS plugin they, instead of getting the most up-to-date one every time. Um, so I'm building this sort of right into the plugin system where as part of that standard out, plugins will also report their version. Uh, and then the plugin system will automatically do the constraints um, and also downloading as well. So the, the plugin system, even for Vault, even for cryptographically secure things, will be Vault plugin install and then like a GitHub URL or an HTTP URL, and we'll be able to do that securely, verify <coughs> everything, and make a pretty nice <coughs> user experience uh, around uh, a somewhat hard problem. And so that's, that's sort of it for our plugin system. But then really quickly, um, almost done here, just want to talk about sort of the future of Go as well as plugins. So there is a spec out, like there is a, it's kind of hard to find, but I link it on the next page. Uh, it took me a, a weird amount of Googling, even though I found it a long time ago. Um, there is a spec coming out for a plugin standard lib. There is a plugin standard library coming to Go, um, <coughs> potentially. It's, it's spec'd out and, and they've started working on parts of it. So. Uh, this is the URL. It's not easy or human friendly, but uh, I could post the slides later so you could find it since Googling for us pretty hard. Uh, but that was the from Google, the spec they wrote for this feature. So the way it'll look basically is something like this. It uses shared library loading, uh, but they made it really easy to use from the standard library. You basically use plugin.open to open a plugin, plugin.lookup to look up any exported function within that <laughs> plugin, uh, and then you, could, you call it in process. It's just go. So Go handles deal open and, and all that stuff. That makes it really easy to use. Um, they wrote the spec before Go 1.6 while they were working on 1.5. No one was really sure if it'd make it into 1.6. Uh, it didn't, not, no parts of it did. So maybe Go 1.7, who knows? Um, but it's still there. Uh, the one thing Go 1.5 did introduce is building shared libraries. 
So that was exciting. I know like Matt, um, Matt <coughs> played around with this a little bit. I played around with it a little bit, but um, you can only build shared libraries for Linux right now, um, and there's no way to really dynamically load them at runtime. They're only really used at build time to dynamically link things. Um, so it's very limited right now. You can't build a plugin system with it, but uh, it shows that they're building the foundation towards this, this future. Um, sort of my viewpoint on it is that we probably won't adopt it. So uh, it, it, our plugin system is super stable. We've been using it for years. Um, things like deal open will just simply never ever be acceptable in a system like Vault. We can't give you access to the memory space, arbitrary binary access to memory space. Um, it isn't a simple go build, uh, and, and it could disable the post process. So it actually destroys one of the core sort of design things I was looking for. Um, at the same time, it has to exist. I want it to exist. I want go to implement it. It does make a lot of things a lot easier. It's just that we probably won't use it. Um, and it could be used. The one thing that it would do much better than our plugin system is <laughs> calling something in memory versus wrapping things in RPC, encoding things, deencoding things, all that stuff. It's going to be way, way, way faster than our plugin system. Um, but the thing is, our plugin system is used in places that are relatively high performance, and we haven't hit that that barrier yet. But um, I can imagine use cases for that, um, like mathematical functions and things like that, that actually need to be pretty fast. Uh, they don't, <laughs> the communication overhead would be way higher than the execution that you'd want something like this. It's just not our use case. So yeah, that, I said this pretty much uh, already. So then the final thing is really like, how could I use this? Like, how could I use the plugin system that HashiCorp created? Uh, and this is kind of awkward. Uh, it's kind of awkward because for now, even we copy and paste the entire plugin system between every project. Um, I started working on extracting it. It's actually pretty close. It was like my Martin Luther King project because I wanted it to be done so I could come here and replace that slide with a smiley face. Um, it's not quite done. It's actually really close. But um, in the future, uh, we'll code down as much as possible and all the RPC stuff and craziness is just going to be in a library that, that you use and everything. Um, you'll get the you'll get everything for free. You get cryptographic uh, loading for free. You get versioning for free. Um, all that stuff will happen. Um, but for now, if you go to Auto Terraform uh, Packer, uh, you could just they're all in the plugin and RPC directories, and you can see between them that they're basically copy and pasted, except for a little bit of code. So unfortunately, it's pretty jank right now, um, which is probably why no one's ever used this. But uh, we are going to extract it, especially since we use it. Uh, on three released and, and five soon projects. So, sorry about that. Uh, but still, the reason I wanted to give this talk um, is because I really, even though Go's been around a long time without any plugin, real DL open support, I haven't seen many projects use multi-process plugins as, as a plugin <coughs> system, even though it's the only way to do it right now. Um, Docker recently actually implemented a plugin system which is multi-process. So, there's a similar, um, they use an HTTP server instead of an RPC thing. They have a little other differences, but um, they ended up doing actually uh, something very similar, so that's cool. Uh, but I do think there's a ton of benefits. Uh, there's a lot possible. You know, By the time we're hitting on being able to do stuff like Vault plugins, it, it shows a lot of maturity in a system like this, uh, the ability to create that maturity. Um, so I do want people to know that a system exists other than DL Open, uh, which has its own downsides and upsides. So yeah, we've been using it for a long time, and we're, we're super, super happy about it. Uh, so that's it. So thank you, and I don't know if we're asking questions. I don't know how this works. So.